Welcome everybody to episode 58 of the Serial Chillers podcast. I am your host, Jesse. Today we cover the story of two different, almost, serial killers. It just really depends on how you look at it. Today we cover Warren Bland and John Cannon. Two completely unrelated stories, but we bring them to you anyway. Also, in the studio with me, returning, Robbie, returning, Bigfoot, first time, Josh, and of course, co-host Greg across the internet far away. Robbie brings a story. Greg's got a PSA. Sit back, relax, and enjoy episode 58 of the Serial Chillers podcast. All right, let's do this shit. Welcome, everybody, to episode 58 of 1 Million of the Serial Chillers podcast from the Super Network studio. I am here with co-host Greg in his bunker far away, all the way across the internet. Yeah. How goes it, co-host Greg? Um, I'm not going to lie to you, dude. Up until like half an hour ago, I was mad stressed out. Well, I'm glad that we've uh, helped you break out of that stress ball you were in. You, you're smiling now, and uh, I'm, I'm excited for the next couple hours. I ate some food. I went live with the people. I'm going to do it again during the break. That is fun. what the fuck is up. Well, I have some returning guests here in the studio with me as well. Uh, to my left, Robbie. Fourth time? Fourth time. Welcome back, Robbie. Yo. <laughs> Damn, Robbie, what are you, Bigfoot? <laughs> sitting, getting there sitting across from me first time here in, in super network studio welcome josh what up hey how's it happening? going very well very oh. well thank you yeah. and the man who's been here so many times we made him a theme song welcome back bigfoot, <laughs> bigfoot. It's Tuesday, my dude. <laughs> did you did you ever translate that that samurai chatter for us? Um, they were uh, questioning the philosophy of humans. Oh Lord! Oh no! <laughs> hey Casey, but for me, yeah, it damn. was a Tuesday. Oh, M. Bison, Chen Li. Oh, can you get that? There you go. Now you got that. I got that now. All right. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, B I W G F W O T designs. designs. Yes, go check that shit out. Uh, welcome, Josh, for the first time. Welcome Thank back, you. Robbie, who got a W your last time. I'm two and one. Two and one all against Bigfoot. Okay, so uh, he's he's got two opponents tonight, though. Three guys, men enter. Yes. <laughs> One Three man. men are also allowed to leave of their own volition yeah. at any time. <laughs> yeah, that is that is true. And the winner of this, as you all know, gets nothing. Oh. So uh, I'm out of here. Uh, it's, a, it's a hella Greg sticker. <laughs> they've already been handed them. And besides that fact, you guys know how the show works. Let me explain it for anybody that doesn't. Each week, I knock things over. <laughs> Each. <laughs> That's what's great. We don't do this live. I could take extra takes. <laughs> it was no, I leave it. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Each week, I sit down with old friends, new friends, good friends, and bad friends to tell them the story of an infamous serial killer. Throughout the show, you guys can chime in on my story, and if you brought a story of your own that is true crime, dark, creepy, unsolved, or otherwise mysterious, please feel free to share it. Lastly, if you have questions about questions, make sure to ask questions because I cannot answer questions about questions if you never asked questions. Are there any questions? Never. Nah. No. Then welcome to and let's play the Serial Chillers podcast. That's nice. I like. Also, that I really like the way you guys responded there. It was very succinct. It. I. I liked it, and I almost felt like I heard it here, here, and then here. <laughs> wow. Is that I can't see you. I just want to know is yeah. that in alignment with your chakras? <laughs> Some good ASMR. No, I I yeah. <laughs> was good ASMR. <laughs> and I left my chakras outside when I was having a cigarette. I fucking oh. forgot to bring them in. Dang. Don't don't let the don't let that uh sea air get to them. This episode serial killers are Ooh. separate stories. Oh. Warren James Bland and John Cannon. Whoa. Greg, I'll give you a chance to respond. You, I, I could tell how badly you want to. <laughs> no, that's cool. <laughs> that's just, just the way my face looks now. <laughs> Is it resting bitch face? 
So, nope. so here are the two things about Warren James Bland and John Cannon. These guys are like they're the same person. What on that? So these are like some of the the like killers I've put on a list or somebody has sent me, but there's just not shit for information. Or they're like borderline serial killer. Like in a lot of cases or definitions, these guys might not be serial killers. But I find both stories interesting. So this is a, we'll call it an on the fence episode. You're gonna get two for one. Nice. Uh, neither guy is really technically serial killers, but they're both serial criminals and uh, they're fucked stories. So, question number one. Do it really high. Do it really high. In what year <laughs> was Warren James Bland born? I think last time we did a twofer like this, I kept trying to get the term double beheader going, but I don't think it ever really took off. Oh, man. It must not have because I don't remember that at all. It took off yeah. in my heart. <laughs> oh. Whoa. And then you should see a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have answers? All right. Robbie says 1926. Josh says 1958. Casey says 1957. Jesse says, right, just a little bit bigger next time. <laughs> And for this question, Robbie will score 250 Ooh. points because Warren James Bland was born January 21st, 1937. Oh. Ooh. Yes, let me, just, let me just punch that into the electronic scoreboard here. Fancy. <laughs> It's uh, all the rage these days, I've heard. Well, the episode with uh, Curtis where he was arguing points about how many he had. <laughs> Yeah, there was a big, was there was a big prize that night, so I'm not surprised <laughs> that he, he was doing that. Um, it was, of course, nothing. So there's that. Know. Hear that biscuit? You're getting Justice called out, Boy. Man, I haven't heard about biscuit Boy. in a while. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, so January 21st, 1937, Warren James Bland is born in Culver City, California. Oh snap! Yeah, like I said, not a ton of information about these guys, so these ones are going to be kind of. 1949, he's now 12 years old, and his father dies of a heart attack. Next major life event is going to be July 1st, 1955. He marries Sue Ellen Sweeney. Uh, she and he are both 18 years old, and he raped her on their wedding night, then continuously for their marriage that lasted two months and ten days. Wow. Good Lord. Yeah. I, like, of all the nights where, like, maybe you don't have to rape someone... <laughs> Your wedding night seems like maybe that would I don't I don't know I, yeah I don't I don't understand yeah. I'm not saying yeah it's so what, so uh, <laughs> yes he rapes his brand new wife of one hour I guess yeah the night his wedding night so uh, September 11th 1955 Sue oh. Ellen files for an annulment citing grounds of extreme cruelty and grievous mental suffering yeah that Fuck. seems fair yeah that seems Did fair you say 1975. 55. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no worries. They were all 18. Yeah, 18 years old. So, uh, September 30th, 19 days later, Bland joins the military. Question number two. What branch? I like this question, because these motherfucking killers pretty much always join, uh, always join the military. Yeah. I think it's, be it's not like the military makes killers. It's that all these guys are like, oh, let's go here. I'm going to get to fucking kill somebody. All right. So uh, we've got two armies, one navy. But Bland joins the Marine Corps. Ooh. Ooh. Yes. He enlisted for a three-year stint in the Marine Corps and immediately shipped to San Diego for basic training. A whale's Hell vagina. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, nobody scores on question number two. Great job, guys. Thank you. We're Robbie's Robbie's still up 250 to nothing. But guess what? Question number three. Very early in his military career, he will have a big event. What is it? A. He saves the life of another soldier. B. He assaults another soldier. C. He gets a promotion. Or D. He goes AWOL. One more time. Or order one more time. Uh, he saves the life of another soldier, assaults another soldier, gets a promotion, goes AWOL. So we've got two assault another soldier, one gets a promotion, 
Five weeks into basic training, bland went AWOL. Dang, Stumping you fools, man. Five so, weeks? Five weeks. I, I but, thought for sure that he would have just stayed because... One thing that serial killers are not is quitters. Just <laughs> <laughs> keep uh, going. Yeah, I would imagine five weeks is about the time where it's getting rough. Like five weeks into basic, like you've, they've. I mean, I'm sure they're not easy on you when you get there, but five weeks in, it's probably where they're really fucking like separating the people who are like psychologically and physically prepared to do this and getting ready to dismiss the people who are not and he was like i'm not even gonna fucking let him decide i'm out of here no more sit-ups yeah so you know uh, did, did it say where he went well let's see san diego uh, oh, oh okay Thank you. yeah oh yeah that's right he's in san diego so after five weeks uh into basic training he goes awol he is found a month after he goes missing and he's sent to the brig for six months uh he is brought back to basic training after the six months April 19th, one day early, 1956, he goes AWOL a second time and is classified a deserter. So we all know how uh, lenient the U.S. military is on deserters. They're very, uh, no. I mean, <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say. <laughs> uh, Bird yeah, doll. This was 56. <laughs> I think we all knew who you were talking about. <laughs> no, I was specifically calling him out in case he listens to this. Okay, year. okay. Hear that, Bo. Yeah, Bo, hit us up. August 7th, 1956, at 19 years old, he's arrested and court-martialed and sentenced to another six months uh, in the brig. Uh, then he is dishonorably discharged for conduct unbecoming. January 12th, 1957, he's tw- 20 now. It's his official release from the U.S. Marines. So, uh, you know, he was in for like a year and a half total and spent like a year in the brig. <laughs> Sick. Real productive. Yeah. So he hard. He hard. <laughs> Um, Dear mother, he's always hard. Military is fun. <laughs> Please write back. Uh, I'm loving it in army. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Later, right after he gets out, uh, July of 1957, he's a suspect in the murder case of a police officer who is on duty, but he is never charged with any crime. There's a lot of this in Warren James Bland's life. This piece of fucking shit. Uh, October 18th of 57, he pleads guilty to Grand Theft Auto. Sorry, skipped one. You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, September of 1957, he's arrested for taking a 1956 Thunderbird for a test drive and keeping it. Ooh. Yeah, boy. I liked it in the 50s. You're like, I want to test drive this. And they're like... There are the keys, guy. Come back and buy it with a handshake. You know, like <laughs> well, you're ex-military. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you was a dishonorable discharge. Oh no. Yeah. So uh, he takes off in this 1956 Thunderbird. Uh, it didn't last. Uh, on October 18th, he pleads guilty to grand theft auto and sentenced to 30 days in county jail and three years probation. So, you know, there's that. He's probably good, right? Like, yeah, he's got to spend 30 days in. He spent a year in the brig. Like, you, you got to turn your life around at this point, right? Come on. The, it's, the system's about rehabilitation. It's trending in, in the right way. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, in May of 1958, he's now 21 years old. He took a woman named Dorothy Cobb to Las Vegas and married her. Uh, this woman was a rape victim of his from just a few months prior to this. Huh. Uh, seemed a little for like he drug her to Las Vegas and married her. Like you're, you know, marry me. Let's do this. Come on, marry. Let's do it. When say he married the words. her, when he married her, did he just stare in the eyes and say, "Checkmate"? <laughs> <laughs> I I wasn't there, and I cannot say for certain, but yes, okay, yes, that did happen. It does sound to me like he was playing that 4D chess all these people talk about nowadays. <laughs> he, he's figuring the game out, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's sp- weird. That 4D chess is in my scribbles from earlier. Whoa. Spring of 1959, he is found guilty of assault with a deadly weapon, but lessened to assault with force likely to produce great bodily injury after slicing a man in the abdomen with a bayonet. Question, question number four. Where the fuck do you get a bayonet? <laughs> <laughs> Ex-military, bro. Oh, question. I thought that was the question. I was oh, just yeah. guessing. Uh, uh, <laughs> question number four. Why? Did he slice the man in the stomach with a bayonet? A, he insulted his car. B, the man tried to talk to his wife. C, he was robbing the man. D, 
for no reason at all. That one what I feel the, is scary. What was the order? The one more time. Uh, oh, Casey in, insulted his car. No. Tried to talk to his wife. Okay. Now you know. Okay. Okay. Uh, Casey and Robbie both are going with the man. Tried to talk to his wife. Josh says no fucking reason at all. And Josh is wrong. Casey and Robbie oh, score two hundred and fifty yes. points each. It's okay. He has principles. Beans. <laughs> Hey, you come back here and have sex with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, Robbie 500, Bigfoot 250, Josh, not on the board yet. No. But remember, guys, there are 17 questions tonight. Trying to get that grand prize. <laughs> A one-way first-class <laughs> ticket to Albuquerque. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Anymore, and we got to pay for it. Isotopes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Isotopes. So, uh, yes, uh, the man tried to talk to his wife. And from what I understand, it was like, good, good evening, ma'am. Like, it was nothing. <laughs> he goes to his car, and he, he straight, like, gut sliced the guy. Fuck. Uh, I believe, let's see, for trying to talk to his wife, the move he performed on the man was referred to in the police report as a gut slash. This yes. Nice. Yes. Uh, Dorothy, his wife, was seven months pregnant at this time. She's in she's seven months pregnant, like sitting in the car. Guy. Oh, good evening, ma'am. Who oh, fuck did you say to my wife? Wow. Like, yeah. Damn. So there's that. Uh, I'm gonna do this, and if you walk into it, it's your own fault. <laughs> 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 all right. Bye. Yeah. All right. Bye. Question number five. He won't serve any time. For this crime. Rather, pay a fine. And the man's medical expenses, as well as a length of probation. This is a two-part question. 500 points possible. Actually, 2,000 points possible, technically. Shit. How much was the fine? How long was the probation? The fine plus the medical bills or just the fine? Medical bills, don't worry about them. I want to know how much the fine from the police was. And how long the probation was for. Two part question. 250 points to the closest for either. 1,000 points if you nail either. You nail them both. This is a 2,000 point question. You're pretty much walking away a winner. And what year was this? This would have been 1958, I believe. I'm probably going to have to. My inflation I'm, I'm probably going to have to look back on these, but. Okay, good call. Let me look here. I can tell you this right now. Somebody has scored a thousand points. Ooh. So there is a thousand points out there somewhere. Bigfoot, right for the team. Bigfoot thinks that it was Josh. Mm -mm. So <laughs> as for the matter of how much the fine, Casey said two hundred and fifty dollars. Josh said sixty five dollars, and Robbie said fifty. Fifty dollars. He was fined. $250. Oh! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and Which is approximately $2,180. So it's about a $2,200 fine, and Bigfoot lands 1000 Damn, bruh. Yeah, so... You ain't brown, bruh. How long was the I probation, did. you ask? For this answer, Bigfoot said six months. Robbie said two years. Did you say six months as well? Yeah. Six months for Josh as well. Robbie's going to get 250 <laughs> points on this one because he got five years probation Ooh. with this $250 fine. Dang. So in this question, Bigfoot scores 1,000. Dang, bro. Good job. Yeah, very good job. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Robbie gets 250. And Josh is setting up for Operation Don't Get Shut Out. Hey, for that no -hitter. Operation <laughs> Don't Get Shut Out is in full effect. What is that one? It All right. is Big Tom's Milkshake IPA. Oh, snap. Milkshake IPA. Check out Big Tom's. So uh, the <laughs> not, score... Not an official sponsor. <laughs> the, they pay us. The score <laughs> is Bigfoot 1250, Robbie 750, and Josh Settle. Uh, plenty of time, dude. 17 questions. There's don't forget 12 questions to go. I like how often these are coming. You guys enjoying this? Yeah. Doesn't do. matter. I it's do. our show. <laughs> April 14th, 1959. 22-year-old... Uh, bland 
uh, gets a two hundred fifty dollar fine, pays the medical expenses, which I could not fucking find. I can't imagine they were they were probably another two hundred fifty bucks and five years of probation for the stabbing. Shit. So in June of fifty nine, just a couple months later, Bland's daughter Debbie Ann is born, and on uh, in August of nineteen fifty nine, Bland rapes a woman. In September of fifty nine. Dorothy left Bland, fleeing to Alaska for six months to live with uh, a cousin of hers and only returned to file divorce. When she was back in town, she read in the papers that Bland had been suspected of the rape in August. So imagine this for her. She's like, I gotta get away from this fucking crazy asshole. I gotta get my kid out of here. They're in Culver City aroundabouts, and she goes to Alaska. She's not like, I'm gonna go to. Fresno. Yeah. I'm going to go to, you know, <laughs> San Diego. Um, yeah. Intercourse, Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go to Alaska. I'm going to cross Canada. Uh, so hopefully, say, I got to go through another country yeah. to get back to my own country yeah. to get away from this guy. <laughs> so, Might as well go to Puerto Rico. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then she comes back and she reads in the paper that he's like suspected of rape. Uh not a lot's going to come out of that. That's pretty much about as far as it goes. Said, because, nah, baby, that ain't me. <laughs> oh, my God. She was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I think she went right back to Alaska after filing <laughs> the shaggy? divorce proceedings. Yeah. And and was he raped her again. Again. Was Oh, my God. <laughs> so uh, January 4th, 1960, he rapes a 46-year-old secretary while she was on the clock. Apparently, it was like a... On the clock? Walked in. She was at her desk. Did the deed. Left. Wow. January 9th, 1960... Uh, he rapes another 40-year-old woman. So most of these here are ones that he confessed to afterwards and can, for the most part, be corroborated, apparently. Uh, I'm not, I didn't do any of the corroborating. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> take these with a grain of salt. You'll see when the, the real official ones uh, come up here. Uh, on January 11th of 1960, he's charged with forcible rape, robbery, kidnapping, kidnapping for the purposes of robbery, and four counts of attempted rape. So <clears throat> that's for these two previous crimes. February 8th, 1960, he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity and denied any prior offense. He is evaluated by several psychologists who receive very different accounts of the crimes from Bland. In early 1960, at 23 years old, he's committed to a Tascadero State Hospital for a 90-day observation period. <laughs> Okay, weird whispering. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, in June, uh, he is determined to commit Bland to the hospital for an indeterminate amount of per- for an indeterminate period. Question number six: How long will that period be? He went for a ninety day observation to the hospital. How long will they end up holding him? Question number six: Two hundred fifty points for the closest one thousand points. If you mail it. How long do they hold him? How long is he there? He's there for a 90-day observation. That's what he initially went for. He pled insanity. They take him for a 90-day observation. How long does he stay during this observation? Because they can keep him longer. Because he's fucking crazy. Maybe. (laughs) Robbie says 93 days. 67, is that what said? 75, sorry, dumbass. (laughs) <laughs> Me, not you. I, could, I was way off. I looked How at it five you. seconds ago. Uh, 120 days from Bigfoot. Well, Bigfoot, congratulations. You got Damn. 250 points. You got the points, but you weren't close. Oh. You just guessed the most because they ended uh. up holding him for five years. What the Ooh. hell? I was perfectly legal. This is how it works. Uh, they took his insanity I was, plea. I was going to guess like a under, week. They took his insanity plea, put him under a 90-day observation. Uh, the doctors determined, like I told you, in June, they committed him to an indeterminate amount. <laughs> And five years later, I'm not questioning <laughs> yeah. you. No, no, no. I'm just trying to just trying to sh- show you what what happened and Damn. how it happened. So let's give uh, Bigfoot another 250 here. Um, oh, goodbye. It's it's getting. Sweet, if Casey's not sweet. asleep by the end of this episode, he he's he's looking good so yeah. far. <laughs> yes. Okay. Like we were saying, he <laughs> my cheeks hurt. <laughs> it was a good episode. Uh, 
So they took his plea bargain, or they took his insanity plea, 90-day observation, five years later, 1965, he's now 28 years old, the head of hospital recommends that Bland be sent back through the criminal justice system because he was not benefiting from the treatment at the hospital. Well, after five years? Five, <laughs> they tried. You can't say they didn't <laughs> try. <laughs> they gave him five years, and they were like, all right, look, this literally is not working at all. This like a fucking uh, guy. You know that that uh, stuff we were talking about before we started recording? I can imagine he did a lot of that while he was <laughs> at... Uh, yeah, for $1 million donated to the Patreon, I will tell you what we were just talking about. I will, tell you. I will tell you for $50. <laughs> <laughs> you undercutting son of a bitch. <laughs> now Way it's undercut buyer's you. market. <laughs> Uh, okay, so yeah, I was gonna say way to, way to give it like point zero 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 one percent of the. Uh, that's fine though. It's fine. Um, he's not salty. <clears throat> so uh, he's transferred to a prison where, on September nineteenth, nineteen sixty seven, he is released and put on five years probation. Again. So just that's just two years. So he spent five years determining whether they can help him or not. And they were like, dude, he needs to go to prison. We can't help him. He gets to prison. Two years later, they're like, he's good, man. Send him back out. What is he doing here? So uh, I believe the phrase is good enough for government work. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. Mm -hmm. Way to keep a low profile, Greg. November 21st, (laughs) 1968. He is now 31 years old. Bland is behind bars again after two women were raped and two had fought off the attacker, and a 15-year-old girl was left for dead after her throat was slit. The attacks were from August to November. Uh, April 3rd, 1969, he is sentenced to three years to life for one rape count, one to 25 years on kidnapping charge, and five years to life on burglary counts, all sentences to run concurrently. On August 22nd, 1975, six years later, Bland is paroled. One year later, almost to the day, Bland is arrested again for assaultive sexual conduct. For the first time ever, his victim was a young girl. Uh, Younger than 15. I believe she was like nine. Uh, Like 15 is a young girl, but I mean like a a child. A child. Yes. Kid. April 6th, 1980, he's released from prison again after being incarcerated for the above crime. So that's five years again for three rapes, one of a child. December 30th, 1980, he is attacked and tortured. Sorry. He attacks, tortures, and rapes an 11-year-old boy. Uh, 1980, uh, later the... Or sorry, during the same time, between prison terms, he moved in with a woman and her three daughters, which he also molested. January 1981, Norma Williams, the woman he's living with and molesting his daughters, felt she could turn him around with good old God, Christianity, and she married Bland in an attempt to do so, unaware that by this time, Bland had already molested all three of her children. A little bit of codependency there, huh? This episode is brought to you by James Gunn. (laughs) (laughs) How dare you? (laughs) Topical. (laughs) February 17th, 1981. He is now 44 years old. He's arrested for suspected child molestation and released on $35,000 bail. Uh, I think a lot of people get confused on this, and I think we can clear this up really quickly. When you get when you get a, an amount for bail like this, everybody's like, "Where the fuck do they get thirty five thousand dollars?" It's ten percent. Yeah, ten percent of your bail is what you pay a bail bondsman. They get you out of jail, and then you, you, you can figure it out with them. But uh, <laughs> and then they chase you around, and tell you to come to Christ, and give you a cigarette. <laughs> oh. Get to Christ, bruh. <laughs> I am the dog, the big bad dog. That's one of my favorite episodes. Uh, one of the non misses. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that, none. Matt Stone and Trey Parker. Yeah. Uh, did you be, 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 thirty-five thousand dollars bail, ten percent? That's right. That's how it goes. Here we go. July 24th, 1981, he pleads guilty to two counts of child molestation with the use of a deadly weapon admitted to prior convictions. He is sentenced to nine years in prison and sent to the California Men's Institution in Chino, east of Los Angeles. When speaking with with prison psychologists, (laughs) he admitted for the first time that he had been a lifelong drinker, he said, since the age of 14. So he drank daily from the age of 14, he claimed. 
September of 1981, Bland is attacked in prison by fellow inmates, and his neck is split from ear to collarbone, and he almost bled to death. So there was, from what I understand, it was an overhand strike. Boom! And they caught him down the... And not a gut shot. Not a gut shot like he deserved, that piece of fuck. Uh, January 20th, 1986, Bland is paroled again. December 11th, 1986, uh, what do we got, 11 months later, Phoebe Ho uh, is seven years old and is abducted <laughs> in... Sa- get it together, Robbie. <laughs> Class it up. <laughs> laughing because Casey laughed. <laughs> yeah, but Casey didn't audibly laugh. <laughs> <laughs> that makes the difference in radio. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, that might stay in. We'll see what happens. <laughs> December 11th, 1986, BB Ho is abducted in South Pasadena, California. Ha, ha, ha. December. <laughs> this is going downhill quick. Yeah, it sounds like you're laughing at Pasadena, which I endorse. <laughs> Uh, December 18th, 1986, Phoebe Ho's body is found in Riverside County, California. She is found by a man walking to collect cans on a rocky outcrop of Rural Road. Witnesses say it looked just like a child asleep on their side. She had been strangled, and although it wasn't initially clear, she was also sexually tortured and molested. Uh, It said with common, like, household tools. There was not specifics, and I don't really... We did the Lawrence Bittaker episode. I can... Pliers seem to be quite popular, no. I guess. Is, I thought it was a sponge. <laughs> there you go. Not a drill? Um, oh, oh, man. Yeah, that, that's yeah. extremes right there, guys. All right. So uh, Jesus Christ. On, <laughs> on January 3rd, 1987, a search warrant is obtained to search Bland's house. Forensic matches for fiber from Bland's car and a hair found in the search match to Phoebe Hope. On January 1987, now 50-year-old Bland goes on the run and changes his name to James Thaddeus Sterling or Charles St. Germain. I like the second one better. Sounds very porn star. Uh, In late of January 1987, Wendy Osborne is walking home from school. She is 14 years old. She is never seen alive again. February 1st, 1987, uh, he is now 50 years old. At this time, the body of Wendy Osborne is found in San Bernardino County, and Bland is suspected of her murder, but never charged. He is also said to be the best suspect in an abduction of another seven-year-old girl where, uh, near where Phoebe was abducted. The young girl's name was April Ann Cooper, and she was playing at a park near her trailer park when, sudden, when she suddenly went missing and was never found. Although there is uh, another more likely suspect in the case, we cannot rule out Bland. So, like... 15 years later, they started connecting some other guy by some uh, possible DNA evidence, but he's never been officially uh, made as the serial or as the killer of the girl, and uh, Bland has never been excluded from the list of suspects. So, yeah, 31 years later, and he's still he's still on there. This is abnormal, right, for someone that's over 50 to kind of be going to their prime in the killing time, right? Correct. Uh, it's usually like late 20s early yeah. 30s even early i think 22 to 24 is when psychopathy usually starts to like manifest so watch out robbie yeah. oh oh got it <laughs> um <laughs> on february 3rd 1987 oh, wow he is the charges are filed for the murder oh. of phoebe ho uh later in february um Bland is found in Pacific Beach, California, at a taco stand. So he's in PB. He went back to PB, San Diego. Bro. Went to his roots, dude. dude the uh, waves are fucking corduroy, bro. <laughs> you can just get pitted all yeah. day. So oh, when, Casey is asleep when, over there. When I heard, uh, when I heard PB <laughs> and taco stand, I literally was like, I've probably been there. Yeah. If it still exists, I've probably been there. When we lived in San Diego, it's a That's lot true. of... And it wasn't for the PB party scene. It was for the taco stands. There's quite a few, and it's it's the shit. It's a good spot. Anyway, so he tried to flee the cops, and they found him at the taco stand. And while they were running, they shot him uh, right in the back of the leg and buttock. Uh, He kept running, though. So they got him twice, but he was like, fuck this, and was somehow (laughs) able to still get away uh, for a while. I think... (laughs) I think they just followed the trail of blood like they're tracking a deer because eventually they found him like slumped over. He was he had nearly bled out. 
Dang. So him running away and hiding, they were like, all right, just follow this fucking trail of blood. Call us when you find him. He's got two gunshot wounds. Yeah. Just wait it out. Yeah. He's, now, he's now mounted on a wall somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he's given expression. the proper medical care and does survive the two shots. Why, though? You know what I'm saying? Uh, February 1987, he is also suspected but never charged with the murder of Ruth Ost. So this is while he was on the run and back in San Diego. Ost is 81 years old. Uh, sh- when they searched his car, they found items of hers, some of which even had her name written directly on them. <laughs> wow. So there were some mail and like some like, personal items that she had like written her name on the tag of or something to that effect. So That's my compact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. So uh, there are several witnesses to claim uh, to have seen a man matching Bland's description leaving Ost's apartment only minutes after the suspe- – the, uh, oh, she was suspected to have died. So he's – she – sorry, let me take a step back here. She befriended him. She, you know, he's an older man. He's 50 at this point. She's 81. I'm not saying that's like completely normal, but like he's not a young, he's not 24 or something. Like it wouldn't be probably crazy abnormal to see these two older folks maybe form a relationship. But he's in it obviously for uh, ulterior motives. uh, And he's seen leaving the scene of the crime minutes after she was uh, said to be found dead. So there are people saying, oh, I saw him leaving the complex. So this new friend of hers she just made over the last couple of weeks has been having over her apartment. Uh, so uh, January of 1993, he's now 56, and the trial is finally set for the murder of Phoebe Ho. So he's been in prison for six years at this point, and he's finally going to trial for this. Uh, on February 24th, 1993, 56-year-old uh, Bland is found guilty. Question number seven. What will be his sentence? Will it be 45 to life, no parole, the death penalty, life with possibility, or 25 to 45 years? 45 to life, no parole, death penalty, life with possibility, 25 to 45. All right. Bland is sentenced to death. Jesus. Yes. Wow. California, dude. They like to send some to death. Yeah. They just don't really like to kill them that much. Or at least very quickly. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry, guys. Shut out on Nobody? that one. No one. No one. I'm just trying to get that zero at the end. What did you put? Uh, D. This is nuts. Casey doesn't even remember. 25 to 45 years, Casey said. So it was said that the jury implored the judge to please seek the death penalty. Bland had been in prison for 25 of the prior 28 years of his life, and each time he was released, he had reoffended in some type of sexual crime. Now, let me say that again. He had been incarcerated for 25 of the prior 28 years of his life. Living the dream. Yeah. So, Somebody's dream. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and again, every time he came out within a year, he committed some type of sexual crime to go right back in, uh, because he's in California. Question number eight, August 30th, 2001 bland would finally die in prison. How was it a lethal injection B the gas chamber C natural causes or D still alive? August 30th, 2001. Lethal injection, gas chamber, natural causes. He's still alive. Curveball. Robbie sighed. He's bummed. We've got uh, Josh and Bigfoot with natural causes. Robbie said, still alive. He thinks it's a trick question. Well, this is the end of story for Bland. He, he definitely died. Fuck. He definitely You got died. me with that one. Yep. He died in prison. From Natural Causes. Congratulations, Josh. You're on the board. Dang it. Bigfoot extends his lead. And we're going to take a little break here. We're going to come back with, uh, with two stories. Uh, Greg said his is not really a story. We're going to learn something tonight. So uh, oh, we're going to come back with I'm a story. i school, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to come back with a story from Robbie and uh, uh, Greg's Crazy Corner. So come back or we'll kill you. <laughs>
Welcome back, everybody, to episode 58. We took a nice uh, 29 minute five. Uh, it's good to be back. We've got two little uh, stories here. Robbie brought one, and Greg's got something. So, uh, R- Robbie, I, you just told me very briefly, and I didn't look it up. Oh, Normally, good. I look it up, and I like kind of I, I want to poke around this time. You're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let's uh, let's yeah. hear what you got. Well, Tell the, me about it. The reason that I that I did this one was uh, because of my wife. So, shout out to my wife for this one. Holla. Um, the woman's name is Hilda Nilsson. She was born uh, May 24th, 1876 in uh, Helsingborg, Sweden. She became known as the angel maker of Bruksgatan Street. Uh, she's widely considered the uh, Sweden's most notorious female serial killer. Um, she grew up there. She married a man named Gustav, and she lived there. Um, as a way to uh, raise cash, uh, Hilda and Gustav, they became what was known as baby farmers. This was a very common practice uh, in Sweden during that time um, for women that had babies uh, out of wedlock. Um, also during that time, that was considered a crime. And so women would take uh, their babies to these baby farmers to raise the babies. Uh, oftentimes leaving them there to never contact, you know, just to raise them. Um, And what Hilda would do is she would have her house be the cleanest of them all, be the most appealing of them all, so women would leave their children with um, Hilda and Gustav. Then what Hilda would do is she would, not long after the babies were were, uh, given into her custody, she then would drown the babies Ah. In a small bathtub, what she would do is um, like a like a metal bathtub. She would put the baby in there, and then she would place heavy objects like a washboard. There's actually a picture that I'll show you guys: a washboard or uh, and a coal scuttle is what it was called on top of it, and just leave the baby in there for hours. And then she would come back, and the baby would be dead. She would then either no. yeah <laughs> no you don't say. <laughs> She would then either burn the babies, cremate the babies, or she would bury the babies, either or. Um, now, it, this wasn't... It was almost common practice for, for these babies to not make it very long because these baby farmers would, wouldn't take care of them. So what she was doing wasn't much different because these other baby farmers would just... They would die of neglect. They would die of neglect, malnutrition. You know, they would die. But, but uh, Hilda was actively murdering these babies. Um, she was discovered because a, a woman named Blenda Henkerson. Uh, uh, she wanted to contact her, her child. And now you know how I feel. <laughs> with those last names. I actually told my wife that earlier. Like, I'm going to fuck these names yep, up. Yep. And, and uh, Hilda, um, she refused. She said, no, you can't have any contact with the, with the child. Uh, the child's now mine. And so uh, Belinda actually went to the police, and the police came and found very sufficient evidence for um, uh, Hilda being murdered for all these children. Um, Hilda was taken to trial on in June and the trial lasted about uh, 15, 16 days and she was actually sentenced to death is what she was. Question number one. In what form of death was she sentenced to? Sweden in what year? Sweden in... In 19... 1917. Dang. Beheading. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, guillotine. So you're going to go beheading or guillotine? I'm going to go hanging. Hanging? I said hanged as well. Hanging as well? Ooh, yeah, ooh, ooh, mind. can I change mine? You can if you'd like to. Uh, burned at the stake. Burned at the stake. Oh, I hope it's that. Well, Greg, you <laughs> shouldn't have changed your answer because ah. 250 points is going to go to our fearless leader here. She was sentenced to death by guillotine. Dang. 
Put it on the board. Pretty sure France like last executed somebody by guillotine in like the fifties or sixties. Like, no, it was the seventies. Seventies, yeah. like nineteen seventy four or something. Dang. Honestly, like if that blade's sharp enough, though, like that's, that's not a way. bad way to yeah. go. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. No, because you're because remember that guy did the experiment. You're you're there for a few seconds afterwards. It's Maybe. all good, bro. Yeah. And then you're just like, fuck. All right, dude. Peace, bro. It's like taking. It's like taking <laughs> one. You took one last picture. Yeah. But it, they never went through with it. Because on August 10th, Hilda committed suicide. By hanging. By hanging. Oh, oh me and tell me she burned By herself hanging. Yes! <laughs> she, you guys are stoked for her death. We won. <laughs> <laughs> there was only one question, so. Nice. Oh, so okay. she decided to hang herself before she was actually sentenced to death. Uh, she hung herself in her cell by uh, linen cloth, by her own linen cloth. Um Unbeknownst to her, that same day, her sentence was going to be changed to life in prison. <laughs> she didn't want to live in prison, She didn't bro. want to live in prison. Now, the, the cool thing about... Well, actually, before we get there, go back a little bit. She was uh, charged with murdering eight children, but believed to have murdered up to 17 children. So, fuck that bitch. She's certifiable. Um... The cool thing about this is my wife told me to say this because she actually went to the prison in Sweden and gave me some pictures, which I can send to you to Please post do. up. That'd be awesome. And while my wife was there, my, my uh, klepto wife actually stole a key from the prison Whoa. while she was <laughs> she there. She borrowed it. <laughs> I'm going to, yeah. I'm this is being recorded. She, she, borrowed. she borrowed it. What's the statute of limitations on a, almost a decade of an international They'll crime? extradite her, yeah. bro. <laughs> so we're going to go. She borrowed a, a key. Um, wow! She bought it in the gift shop. There, she bought it. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a it's identical replica of a key. Um, so Hilda Nilsson, she yeah. you know she was the she angel can. maker of Brooke Scotton Street. So we'll get some photos of the key. Yeah, we'll, I'll send them uh, to you. Get some photos of the prison, and you guys uh, will have to check that out. Wow! Well, fun fact: shit. a time Great. traveler realized that she actually stopped the first coming of Hitler. <laughs> Dang. Hey. Okay, Greg, find out about that conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Greg has uh, a little a little something for us here as well. Uh, I just want you all to stay safe. It's a PSA. Okay, it's a Much PSA. You say. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm here tonight to talk to you about gang stalking and what it is. <laughs> <laughs> the smirk on your face tells me you're not taking this seriously. I- I think my I think my role in your conspiracies is to not take them seriously. Yeah, this isn't a conspiracy, bro. All right. Yeah, this shit happens. I'm man. not I'm not trying to not take. Real. Let's. I was just I was just laughing at what was going on, man. We were all laughing. Um, actually, gang stalking is probably one of the most terrifying things that I think I've ever read about because okay. it's a hundred percent manufactured paranoid schizophrenia, like. It starts like so non noticeable. Like, it's not something that you're going to think about. But, like, I don't know. The, one of the examples would be like uh, you're at a coffee stand and you bump into a guy and he spills the coffee on himself. And you're like, oh shit, man, I'm really sorry. And he's like, no, fuck you, asshole. And you're like, whoa, all right, dude, I guess I'm not that sorry. Go fuck yourself. And you walk off. And like a week later, you go out to leave and there's a coffee cup sitting on your front porch before you go to work and you're like, hmm. And so you pick it up and you throw it in the trash. No, the sir, day, I don't like it. Yeah, and next day, you go to get ready to go to work, go out, open your front door, there's a coffee cup on your front porch. And you're like, what the fuck? So the next day, you get up a little extra early and you're like, I'm going to find the motherfucker leaving coffee cups on my front porch. And nobody shows up and leaves it on your front porch and you're like, well, whatever, maybe I'm just crazy. And you go and you get ready for work and you go out and when you get in your car, there's a coffee cup sitting on top of your car. Like, that shit's designed to make you sound as insane as possible. It's like it's, what the aliens do. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, that's kind of how, I mean, it, that all ties together. Like the, um, the secret of course. clandestine societies and stuff like that to try and keep stuff secret. They use gang stalking as an intimidation tactic. The fucking U.S. government uses gang stalking as an intimidation <laughs> tactic, dude. Sounds like they the greys within our government use it. 
Those dirty Sounds reptilians. Like the greys, because I know the Nordics aren't doing it, so it has to be the greys. <laughs> Whatever. Me, I'm a fan of the Zeta Reticuli. So. Dude, they're all doing everything. It's just Zeta a reticuli. big orgy of porn stones. Um, it, but it, it just starts as like an unpleasant experience, and then there's like repetition, and like, and it, and it builds, you know, like it'll it'll escalate to driving down the freeway, and there's a box of cars around you. You know what I mean? Like there's a car in front of you, a car on both sides of you, and a car behind you, and they're controlling how fast you go. And you're like, oh, man, this is fucking ridiculous. And you're like trying to merge, and nobody's letting you merge or whatever. And then when you get to work and you tell somebody about it, they're like, yeah, man, traffic's a bitch. And you're like, no, they were doing it on purpose, though. And nobody's going to believe you. And the whole thing is to make you sound make you sound as crazy as possible. That way, any information that you have or anything that you may know that you might not even know that you know, but any information that you have, should it ever come out of your mouth, is going to sound equally as crazy as this. And they, it's, it's a whole process it's that 4d chess we were talking about <laughs> they're thinking moves ahead dude they're thinking they're thinking on planes where they're like oh shit this guy heard this this guy saw this phone call or saw these this transaction take place he might not know what he saw but it's in there we know it's in there so they like will actively set this whole thing in motion and i mean they have things they have shit called street theater and it's people trying to look normal like they're acting like like they're out shopping, but they're really not shopping. They're just walking around the store and they're kind of keeping an eye on you and you look at them and they look away and they keep shopping and you're like, oh, you know those times when you're walking through the store and people keep looking at you and you're like, fuck, dude, do I have something on my face or something? Did somebody write asshole on my forehead when I wasn't paying attention? Like, why are people looking at me? Um, it's that, but like everywhere, all the time. You're never not in, a con- in like a non-controlled environment. And even like when you're at home. And so that's one of the scariest things is that they can get they can get your family members and they can get your friends and stuff like that to work actively work against you without even knowing it. They're like, hey, look, don't say anything. This is a welfare check. We're here to check up on so and so. We just need to know, have they been has everything been okay? Have they been saying anything? And like they, you know, please, they're real fragile right now. Don't let them know that we came by. And would you, I mean, would you immediately call your homie and be like, yo, dude, some guy in a suit came by asking questions about how fragile you were. Like, are you, everything cool? If it was or you, would, if it was you, yes. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> this shit, like gang stalking and shit like this is the reason why I have a reminder on my phone to send you a text one, once a week that says, yo, dude, I love my family. I love myself. I love my country. I'm not going to off myself in any way, shape or form. Just so you know, that way when it does happen, inevitably lying. for whatever reason. <laughs> You know that it wasn't me when I get all Seth Rich in the back of the head. <laughs> Shit. Just like Dang. that. So, you know. Yo. Yeah. It's- okay, gang stalking's a real fucking thing, and uh, it's just manufactured paranoid schizophrenia, dude. They're making, you, they're making you feel like you're schizophrenic. I watched a grown man break down. And d- does, just- does it end? Like, or is it... What's the end game? Yeah, uh, what was the guy from Fresno's name, Greg? Oh, God, uh, I can't remember. I forgot to look that part up. I was just... I want to say it's John so something. Uh, this guy, in, he's from Fresno, uh, was from Fresno. And, Greg, oh, I, I think this... still there, I is think. Is that what you're referring to when you said you saw a grown man break down? No. Oh. So um, this, this, was, this was on a documentary I was watching. Okay. This guy was... He, basically, the end game is, to, is, is your death. What? That's the end game. And it's, they're trying to do it as hands off as possible you can whether they whether they drive you to drink yourself to death over the course of 10 years or they you commit suicide by stabbing yourself in the back seven times and setting fire to your house right but yeah the fact that they can get to your friends and your family and stuff like that and you're these they're masters uh they're silver they're silver tongued devils because (laughs) they'll make people fall for it and just be right there in it and not even realize what's happening yeah, it's yeah. The guy, the guy heavy. with the Fresno PD thing, that guy um, had evidence of corruption inside the Fresno PD, and he was um, like actively doing stuff about it. He was trying like to, he was trying channel. to draw attention to it. And yeah. He was trying yeah, to make a, a case channel? of it. Yeah, and sure. the Fresno PD came to him and was like, "Hey, man, you don't have any evidence, so stop." And he was like, "No, I've got evidence." And they were like, well, "What evidence do you have?" And he was like, 
not going to give it to you. And they were like, yeah, but you, I mean, if you've got evidence, we'd like to see it. Otherwise we're going to file a suit against you. And he's like, well, I'll counter sue. And so they did. And it went to court and then Fresno PD was just kind of watching him for a while. And according to him, and he, he was had, like posting videos. Of, was this recently? This was a few years ago. Right. Okay. I think I remember that. Um, so there, he would like, and I, and I, this is the same I, dude that posted like the chemtrail videos in Fresno and yeah, I think that's why that's <laughs> exactly, way. but I, I think that's what Greg is saying. The idea is right. But like yeah. Greg, so it like, I might sound ignorant with this, but it's not necessarily like gangs, right? Like you said, like, like it could be like, you know, police department or whatever. Like it's not just, it's it. Well, it's not. Yeah. The, the, the term gang, don't think like bloods or crips or right, okay, whatever. Okay. It's not gang like that. It's gang like group of people. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, like, so it, and it, and it's the most inconspicuous people. It's people again, who don't realize that they're working against you. Sometimes, sometimes they, they totally know exactly what they're doing. And it, and it escalates and it keeps escalating. And they're like, their thing is repetition. So what happened and to this so, guy? What happened to, the, to the, this guy? There's a documentary about him, and it's called The Truman Show. You can... Uh, <laughs> uh, this no, guy... So, this oh, John Lane guy, so he was John posting Lane. videos John on, on, on YouTube and like Google. Facebook and stuff like that, being like, oh, look at here's Fresno PD sitting out in front of my house in this oh, white van, white yeah. unmarked van. I remember this. Yeah. And, and nobody took him seriously because he'd be like, Fresno PD's stalking me. And they're like, why is Fresno PD stalking me? Because like, I got evidence of corruption. And it just sounds crazy. Like, even me saying it about him sounds fucking crazy. So I get it. But ultimately, he died. And it was uh, the postmortem said he was stabbed in the chest, not the back. But I was using hyperbole. That's no, but I mean, like, literally, I. That would it totally was like make several sense. Times it was in the stabbed chest, in the back, right? you know what I mean? And, like, and his house was set on fire. And they said that I wasn't smoke yeah. inhalation the cause of death. Um, I, I again, I didn't research. I, I could I be making that up too. One, but yeah, but it's all crazy. Yeah, yeah, right. that shit happens. It's totally real. And you know, stay safe out there, people. Like, make sure you tell your loved ones that you don't want to die. I'll text her right now. And keep watching the skis. Don't I feel like that discredits me a little bit, die. and you might be part of this. <laughs> I love. I don't ever mean family. to discredit you. That's not what this is. Whatever. About. I'm glad I'm in the bunker. I'm, I'm yeah. just saying. I'm kind of offended and because I, you said, you know, when I text people that I love these things, and you've never texted me those things. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you should see the tears right now yeah, <laughs> out of his really I, tired I eyes. Like, so it's I, I don't like four times a week on this podcast. That's true. So. That's true. <laughs> so it's I don't want to die. I love my family and my country. Well, yeah, any, anything, anything you think that they're going to use against you because you know, they'll be like, oh, Don't he's a communist. send that to your wife right now. I, I shouldn't? No, yeah, you're going to end should. up texting her for the rest of the night. You too totally late. Should. I already sent it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she goes, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> what? No way she would say that. <laughs> she has no context. So She doesn't need it. <laughs> <laughs> Just believe and trust in what I say. All right, let's go to tonight's second serial killer, John Cannon. Okay, so what I did here was really challenge myself, because if you remember a few weeks ago, I brought in a UK Scottish killer, and I just really butchered some names. So brought in another UK guy. I'm going to see if I can't uh, uh, handle some of these. I, I wish I remembered. I need to look it up. Somebody reached out to me and said, hey, over here in the UK, here's how you pronounce some of these very common cities. And sent me, like, phonetic uh, pronunciations uh, of it. cool. So I'll put it in the outro when we do it. Uh, question number nine. In what year is John Cannon born? This is how you get back in it right here, Josh. You, f- you fucking nail this. I was trying to go for the no quitter. All right. Josh said 37, 41 from Robbie, and 46 from Bigfoot. John Cannon was born February 24th, 1954. 250 points to Bigfoot. Damn it! So uh, 250 more points to Bigfoot, who is up 2,000. 
to seven fifty to two fifty. Oh. Uh, Casey's just a little short of breath, getting a little bit of oxygen over there. Suck it, and, boys. Uh, we're, uh, February 24th, 1954, born in Warwickshire and Sutton Coldfield in England. Whoa. In 1958, at four years old, his parents sent him to a private school for boys. He had a teacher that always ate biscuits during break time. <laughs> biscuits in the English sense, so more like cookies for all of us very confused American Cheers. people. He wasn't eating like a flaky, buttery biscuit. We are so uncultured. Uh, Cannon bragged later in life about how even at four years old, he used his charm to persuade her to allow him to have biscuits as well. Uh, in 61, 62, a teacher took him into a vacant classroom and instructed him to drop his trousers. You like how I just use all the, uh, all the uh, UK terms? Uh, the teacher <laughs> touched him between the legs and wanted John to touch him as well. He did it in fear of the teacher and claims to have felt ashamed uh, from it when it went on for months because he couldn't tell anyone about it. I was just doing it out of anger. Yeah, I mean, but like, he's seven, eight, he's not, I mean, it's... Was this a male teacher or a yeah, female teacher? Yeah, a male teacher. Oh. Male teacher. Uh, so yeah, 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 yeah. Would it have made a difference to you? To me, it would have. <laughs> <laughs> In 1963, he's now nine years old. He was taken to the family doctor because of his nervousness, and he did not return to the school. So he had developed a stammer from being so nervous at being in school because he was being molested by a faculty member. So 63, he was taken to the family doctor. Um, he used the experience at school to explain why he was, quote, different from others and why he didn't have any close friends. Uh, he claimed that he always had to deal with humiliation and shame, which led him to express anger and resentment throughout his life. Uh, for me, it seems to be like a rare actual insight to the mind of something. Usually they're like, my mom touched my uh, dick, so I killed 18 women. Like, I was going to say, it sounds like he like read about it, and he was like, oh, yeah. This, this is definitely. Yep, yeah. And I mean, that's if that's how you figure it out, it's, it's very uh, hard to self-reflect, I think. So. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm not giving him any praise in any means, but I think it's just interesting to see somebody like diagnose themselves and be like, oh no, you're actually, oh my God. <laughs> uh, he, yeah. All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the rare actual insight. Um, 1971 is now 17 years old. He gained five certificates at the school, uh, certificates of secondary education and three ordinary level general certificates of education. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means, and your air quotes might have something to do with it. How many air quotes are we talking? <laughs> Probably, like, at least six. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, question number... I think I fucking misnumbered again, so there might be eight questions I did. Okay, so this is going to be question number ten. He was asked to join an organization while he was in school. At this age, 17. What type of organization was it? Was it A, an athletic organization? B, an educational organization? C, a labor union? Or D, a musical organization? That's a, is that three musical organizations, guys? No, uh, that's a... Uh, oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> In case he has no idea. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So three musical organizations. Fuck. However... Ugh. Bastards. Because of his great athletic ability, he was offered the chance to train with the Birchfield Harriers, which was a leading athletic c club. Which was a leading athletic club, but his father was against the idea. So I looked it up. The Birchfield Harriers is essentially like a group of athletes post-college. So, like, you know, you're done. You're not going to the Olympics or the World Championships or anything. So they go and run, you know, amateur road races and and it seems like they have a pretty cool team, pretty cool program, and they do different things, like biking and swimming, and I think they have a few soccer teams and things like that. So wow. kind of like an overall athletic yeah. you know, group. And uh, his dad was like, nah, listen, fuck that. So uh, who knows what type of structure that could have brought. Uh, you never know, never know. So uh, he leaves school and joins the Merchant Navy, and it was thought that he joined to escape his family uh, because he was only part of the Navy for three months. And I don't know how that works, and I didn't even try to figure that out. I'm just getting too deep at that point. May 1978, at 24 years old, he marries June Vale, his one and only steady girlfriend, and the engagement lasted seven years, from 1971 to 78. Oh, he claims on. he was hassled into marrying her in the end, and his mother-in-law was pressuring them to start a family. 
June then turned up pregnant despite John's attempts at prevention. Uh, so pull out game is weak. Yeah, He's practicing the pull outies. Yeah, and he was not very good at it. So <laughs> pull out king. Uh, they the had a king. daughter named Louise. Uh, yeah, in nineteen pull-out-y. in nineteen eighty two, he was smoking and drinking heavily. At this point, instead of going home after work to be with his family, he would frequent the bars and nightclubs. He was a functioning alcoholic at this age. Uh, he was pretty much going out all night, working all day. Uh, repeat. Uh, at this point, he's working at a car dealership as a salesman. So, perfect job to just be all faded. You're looking at that one, and I will tell you what the what the best what the best prices are going to be. And <laughs> when we go on the test drive, you got to do it because I'm in no shape. <laughs> so yeah, he's a uh, he's a car salesman. February 14th, Valentine's Day, 1980. He meets Sharon Major, who's 32 years old. Uh, Sharon lies to him about not being married. She's like, nah, we married? I don't think so. You see a ring on my finger? It's just a just big old tan right there. And he's like, me neither. Never been married. What? That's fucking dumb. So he starts leading kind of a little double life for a little bit. Uh, he's not He's not holding it down, uh, John Cannon, to, uh, to lead the double life for long. So he uh, just decides Sharon Major is the new way and leaves his daughter and wife behind. So... What a winning good for him. Good for yes. him. So uh, but only two months later, in April of 1980, John and Sharon began living together with her children. They took family trips, and he even met most of her extended family in two months. Good for him. Wow. Guess, yeah. By this time, his ex-wife and daughter were completely out of the picture. Uh, in early December of 1980, John became upset when Sharon's ex was coming to spend Christmas with the kids. He got jealous, but Sharon wasn't going to prevent the kids from seeing their father on Christmas. He's just like, that motherfucker can't come. Like, what? I'm going to be there. Like, yeah, it's my fucking kid's dad. He's like, nah, nah. Like, I don't think so. I don't think so. So uh, picture him in your head right now. I'm picturing Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, but instead of Boston, he's British. So, And I can't see <laughs> Mark kind of Wahlberg same. pulling that off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so <laughs> New Year's Eve 1980... Uh, they hadn't seen each other between that Christmas Eve and this night. Um, John showed up at her house with a bottle of wine and suggested that they talk things out. They spent the evening talking things out over the bottle of wine, and they were back to their old ways. And Sharon claims that night, while having sex with John, that she put his, or he put his hands around her neck so that he, she could barely breathe. She claims that he told her he was going to kill her and even brought a gun, but it turned out to be an air gun. They were just playing question why what the fuck is going 50, on 50 shades of john <laughs> oh, no. see casey knows question number 11 she had to try to get away somehow what did she do did she a push him down the stairs b shoot him with the air gun c make a clean break for it on foot or d stab him with a kitchen knife push him down some stairs shoot him with an air gun make a clean break for it Stab him with a kitchen knife. Air gun. Air gun. What was yours, Robbie? Push down the stairs. Push down the stairs. Robbie's going to get a couple more points on the board Ooh. because she didn't need push him down the stairs to try to get away from this now newly but very violent man. 250 for Robbie on question number whatever the fuck. <laughs> At this point, who knows? Yeah. So, uh, the next, all the questions are just question the next. Uh, <laughs> pushed him down the stairs, try to get away from the now violent man. After falling down the stairs, uh, he like snaps back and he's like, holy shit. And I think he's, uh, like gave her a smack across the face at some point because she's like bleeding from the lip and he saw her bleeding and he was like, holy fuck, what the fuck am I doing? And he like, runs up the stairs and he's like consoling her like, oh, I have no idea what got in him. You know, he's like totally snapped back to himself and she's like, I mean, how conflicted would you, I mean, I don't know. It, it's insane. He, it's like she broke him. Uh, yeah. the, stair, the stairs can be rough. So uh, they, uh, he apologized, sees her bleeding, realized because of, it's all because of him. On the way to the hospital, she said it was like he flipped again and then he said, uh, uh, I meant to kill you. 
you should have never got out of the house. Like, I meant to kill you. I'll fucking kill you. Yeah. So, wonderful. I'm sure they stayed together. March 6th, 1981. Uh, they didn't stay together. <laughs> uh, John meets Gene Bradford, who ran a ladies' knitwear shop. Um, he entered the shop. He, he essentially cased it out for a while, meets her, goes into her shop. Uh, Jean was the only one there, and she was there with her 17-month-old son. Uh, he held a handkerchief over his face, appearing to have a runny nose. He's, what a good disguise, right? Uh, so <laughs> I can he, barely hear you. Yeah. As he went in there, he pulled a knife on her, threatened to hurt her son, and used uh, what she said was, quote, very vulgar language while threatening them. Uh, asked for all the money that she had. Uh, at that time, her mother comes into the store. He takes the mother, ties her up, and rapes Jean in front of the mother and the son. Gene's husband then comes in the front door of the store, and John is like, fuck that, I'm not fighting a man, and tries to dip out the back door. Uh, he gets away, and they report the attack um, to police immediately. March 14th, eight days later, John was questioned about the attacks on Sharon Major, not Gene Bradford. Uh, so, so, yeah, so he's he's all over the place, but it, in just like with uh, with our boy Bland, mm -hmm. nah, never quite, never quite, uh, never quite can't get him. <laughs> <laughs> June twenty sixth, nineteen eighty one, John received a jail sentence for the rape and stealing money from the knitwear shop owner and stealing a car, which he took after quitting the car dealership he worked at. <laughs> So he's like, peace, I'm out, bitches. I'm taking this car. Yeah. I thought it was <laughs> a severance I'm, package. I'm keeping this. Question number 12. How long did he get for these crimes? So remember, it's going to be a rape, stealing money from the knitwear shop, and stealing a car. In what year? Uh, and this is 1981. In years. How long will he uh, I think get maximum sentence, let's call it. We're not doing like three to five years. You want like a one number, right? Yeah, yeah, one number. Excellent question about a question. Thank you. Yes. Overachiever. <clears throat> Bonus points. It means nothing coming from me, but I award them anyway. Appreciate it. I mean, that means a lot. All right. Uh, Robbie said five. Josh said 15. Casey said 22. Uh, John received a jail sentence, uh, or sorry, a sentence totaling a uh, maximum of 13 years. Josh, you're getting 250 yes. points on this one. <laughs> what, and what the fuck? 13 years. That's crazy. Yeah. That's random? Yes. Uh, the th it was like a one to three for one uh, crime, yeah. one to two for another crime, and one to eight for the third crime. I think the rape was one to eight years. And yeah, that's how it uh, shook out for... John Cannon piece of shit or John Canaan it depends on <laughs> who you ask who you ask John Canaan <laughs> <laughs> is that one word it could be I think it's sound, I think it's Klingon <laughs> <laughs> okay so February of 82 he's transferred to Horfield prison in Bristol it's probably Horfield uh, September of 84 he's now 30 years old he was moved to the Vern a semi-open prison at Portland Dorset uh, his father came to visit him two days after he arrived at this prison, and it was the last time that he saw his father, who was terminally ill with cancer at the time of this visit. Um, in February of 1985, was that six months later, John's father passed away, but they exchanged attempts to make peace with each other the last time that he had visited John in prison. So he tried to make amends with his dad on the last time he'd see him. Uh, sure. January 25th, 1986, John was sent to Wormwood Scrubs Prison in a pre-release scheme. This lasted for six months and provided him some freedom, although he was still in custody. Um, apparently, like, they'll, they'll send him into, like, lower, like lower security. security facilities. For, All right, look, you're out in six months. We're sending you here. Like, go fuck off there for a while. Uh, May 3rd, 1986. Uh, he was released after the six months. Sorry. Uh, May 3rd, 1986. Uh, four months after the release, Sandra Court was strangled to death. She was last seen in Lansdowne near Bournemouth around 3 a.m., and John was also in Bournemouth this night. A letter was sent to the police after the discovery of the body, and a handwriting appeared to be disguised as someone left-handed who was writing with their right hand. John just so happened to be left-handed. John was questioned about this murder and still claims to not know this woman. As there was no concrete evidence tying, this, tying him to this crime, he was not charged with the crime, only questioned about it. So he was just like, I don't... Who? And they were like, That's crazy that they can tell that, though. What's that? 
that it was a left-handed dude writing with his right hand. Like, uh, yeah. from the pressure of the pen and the way the ink and just I mean, stuff like that's just fucking crazy, man. Yeah. I think I think to some people it's, like, fooey, and to other people it's taken very seriously. I don't know where it, like, lands in the, you know, in real forensic. Realm or like, of science. Yeah, I, I don't know. I I know that, like, hair follicle evidence is, like, not really being fucked with anymore. It's, like, something that they're, like, I don't think it's really, I don't, I I don't know for sure. I'm not up on all of this, but pretty sure that it's uh, not even admissible in court at this point in some places. Uh, I could be very wrong on that. Let's just, let's just go with that. (laughs) So, uh, (laughs) um, so just question, just question. July 25th. Uh, of 1986, uh, he is uh, fully released. Oh, sorry. So this May 3rd thing, he's not released. It's like a work program. He can right. go out on a work program. Yeah, she was murdered. Release. Yeah, sorry. Missed that line. So he's out on work release while he kills her. And then he gets released in July. So he's out officially after only four years in prison. July 28th of 86, uh, Susan... Uh, that's right. That's three days after the official release. Uh, Susie Lamplew... Uh, She disappears from West London, and John was later suspected of this crime. She's a 25-year-old real estate agent who is scheduled to meet with a Mr. Kipper to show him some property. Uh, He never returned to work that day. She never returned to work that day, sorry. Her car was later found a mile from the street from the property where she was showing Mr. Kipper. Question number the next. What kind of car did Susie Lamplew drive? I'll just tell you this right now. I had the answer, and I was like, what were popular cars in, like, the late 80s in the UK? And this was on the list. So I just put the other four that were, or the other three that were on there with it. So what kind of car did Susie Lamplew drive? Was it A, Saab 900, B, Ford Fiesta, C, a Renault 5, or D, an Austin Metro? Wait, where? Uh, She is in the West London. Born and raised. This is not here? What was A? I'm sorry. A Saab 900, Ford Fiesta, Renault 5, Austin Metro. Renault 5, Saab 900, you said? Renault. Renault 5. She drove a Ford Fiesta. Oh, Ain't nobody getting up on right here. I wasn't thinking Ford. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Uh, apparently it was one of the top five selling cars in the late 80s in, the, in London. Like a party. Uh, yeah, so the reason the car was discovered is that it was Siesta. it was Siesta. badly parked with the handbrake off and the driver's door unlocked. Her purse was still in the car, indicating that she had left in a hurry or was forced to leave. Witnesses also recalled seeing a mid-1970s dark blue BMW, the type of car that John drove, parked at the location of the property that day. So on, in this documentary I watched, it wasn't specifically about him, more about this disappearance uh, in particular. And this, it's this guy, he's like a jogger who was out jogging at the park near this property. And he sees them and he sees the woman arguing with the man and she's in the right, in the right seat. And that's where you drive from. Right. Um, but she's like arguing and then all of a sudden the car takes off and he, and he said he couldn't really wrap his mind about around that. And he's like, it never even, I feel stupid, but it never even occurred to me that it was a left side drive. So he's like, this woman was arguing, talking, and, and it kind of like threw him off, I think, from like the fact of what was happening in the car. Because he's like, she was either laughing or screaming, but the, the fact that she was turned to the side and it took off, I don't know, I found that kind of curious that it just, I think, freaked him out a little bit yeah. and threw him off the situation. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I think that he was, uh, he took her away in his car and uh, went and took her car and, and hit it like a mile away somewhere where he could easily get back. Uh, on this day, John conveniently does not recall what he was doing. Uh, nothing solidly links him to the crime uh, other than the hearsay from the jogger. So he still denies having any involvement with this woman's disappearance in September of 1986. He's now 32 years old. He meets up with Annabelle. So Annabelle is this woman that when he was in prison, he had to want to like see his daughter he got uh, remorseful, I think, and he wanted to know his rights. Like, how do I get her here so I can see her? And I think uh, he was kind of a charming fuck in, at some point. So this woman that came to, like, give him this professional advice in prison, he, he was like, hey, like, I'm out. So he meets up with her. Uh, she, He claims they had chemistry from the moment they met while he was in prison, and they had consensual sex, consensual sex after drinks that night. Uh, later that month, 
uh, I get, I think she was like, all right, that's pretty good for me. I'm done. Uh, later that month, John attempted suicide. Question the next. How did he try to kill himself? Was it A, car in the garage, B, took pills, C, slit wrists, or D, jumped off a building? Burned at the stake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Josh and Robbie say pills. Casey says car in the garage. Uh, he attempted to kill himself by taking 68 paracetamol tablets. Uh, also, for us, uh, acetaminophen. Mm. He took, uh, took 68 uh, aspirins, <laughs> Tylenols. Working on it. All right. Uh, <laughs> it is Bigfoot 2000, Robbie 1250, Josh 750. There are three questions left. So, uh, Robbie can still technically win this thing. I don't remember how many might be uh, able to nail, so I don't think you're out of it yet, but I'm not going to look forward to check for sure. Uh, (laughs) October 6th, 1986, Donna Tucker got into a tiff with her husband and went on a drive to give him some space. She parked under a street lamp to read her book. She saw a man walking back and forth past her car while looking in. Eventually, he stopped and asked for directions. He asked her for a map. As she was looking for it in the glove compartment, the man opened the car door and held a knife to her. He raped her and sodomized her. Uh, She and her husband reported the incident to police who began to search for the rapist. John was suspected uh, as one of the rapists, or as the rapist almost immediately. November 14th, just about a month later, John was questioned about the rape of Donna Tucker officially, but throughout the interview denied everything and was not ever convicted of the crime due to lack of evidence. Yeah, fuck this guy. Such, such, such piece of asshole. shit. No, November 30th, 1986, John moves back in with his mother in Sutton Coldfield. June 14th of 87, John meets Gilly Page, a 24-year-old showgirl. Gilly was on an ice skating, an ice skating tour, so uh, that ended their relationship. So she was like, I gotta go on tour, man. He was like, you can't go... F- Fucking chase your dreams. You gotta stay here. I live with my mom. So that's what I imagine it went down like. I imagine with a different accent, though. Uh, I'm just not gonna embarrass myself right now. No, 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 uh, do it. it. Nope. 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 Yeah, pressure is the way to get there. That's for <laughs> sure the way I react. Peer pressure. Uh, so um, that's not how it works. At at this time. Uh, he, th- he threatened Gilly to like, you don't fucking leave. And he's still with Annabelle during, uh, all of this. So he's doing his thing. Uh, about two months later, his relationship with Annabelle also ends. What do you know? Uh, one month after that, John meets Marja Vilsons. Great. Uh, <laughs> September 13th, 1987, he takes Marja on a date and meets her mother using his charm on both of them. He claims, I think this guy's real into like, hey, I want to meet your fam. Like, bring them all in. Because when I fucking kill you, I want them to remember my face. I can't say for sure that's what was happening, but it, he's he infiltrates and he eliminates. It's very... Uh, Romantic. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at the end of September, uh, he's no longer with Marge. I think she's a little freaked out by it all. John signed up for a video dating agency. I think even John knew that his history would probably catch up with him, so he decides to use a fake name. Question number the next. What fake name did he use? Was it A, John Daniels, B, John Peterson, C, Cannon Richards, or D, Mark Prescott? John Daniels, John Peterson, Cannon Richards, Mark Prescott. Robbie says John Daniels. Josh says Cannon Richards. Casey says Cannon Richards. His new name for the dating service was John Peterson. Oh, so clever. Zeros across the board, guys. John Peterson. He just went with the most common of, of of all the names cited. Uh, John Peterson, in his dating video, requested a girl between 25 and 35 with stunning good looks and to be in great physical shape. 
uh, owners of the agency. This agency was like very thorough. You can see the tapes now. Somebody sits. It's not like the like weird, creepy ones where you sit in front of a cheap background with hearts on. You're like, uh, I like, uh, you know, uh, sunsets or whatever. Like this woman sat there and she like thoroughly like interviewed him. What do you like? You know, what what places would you want a vacation to? It was kind of a. Uh, it was very thorough. I've never seen like a video dating service video like this. So uh, the owners of the service felt there was something not quite right about him. So they never even released his video uh, for other daters to view. They're like, this guy's fucking creep beyond creep. We don't want to be associated with him. So like, we'll just throw this one away. Right. Throw it, ran it over the magnet real quick. The yeah. Magnet. There we go. That's discrimination. <laughs> uh, Let's uh let's take a quick break right here. Take an actual quick five and yeah. uh, come back or I'll kill you. Hey everyone, it's Jesse, and I just wanted to poke in here really quick and get caught up on these Patreon shoutouts. I do apologize to these people who have given and have not heard their name. So a huge thank you to Cassie Ortiz, Carl Flynn, the great Michael, Lacey K, the West family, Paul Flett. Shannon Mahoney, Michael Salter, Jesse Neal, Rachel Towns, Jamie Barbarian, and Alexis Cabrales. Thank you guys so much for giving to this show. Greg and I are pouring everything we've got into it, and we don't plan on stopping anytime soon. If you have not received your stickers from giving to the Patreon, it is getting sent out this week. Thank you, everybody, so much. If you are a $10 or more giver on the Patreon, please log into the Patreon and check your messages. We've sent something out to all you $10 donors. So appreciate everybody who has given at any level. Appreciate anybody who is thinking about it. Now is the time. Greg and I are heading into Season 3 and putting more into it than we ever have. If we can get this rolling, this can be exactly what you guys want it to be and exactly what we want it to be so we're incredibly excited thank you to everybody who's given and keep listening we're gonna keep doing this uh yeah points to whoever scored points john peterson is the fake name he used uh so they yeah they didn't use the footage because they were like he's a fucked up freak and we're not fucking putting this out there we're not gonna endanger anybody that uh uh, we have as actual paying customers. October 7th, 1987, Julia Holman walks to her car alone as a man attempts to force himself into her car. She was able to fight him off, and police suspect, again, John Cannon of being the attacker. <clears throat> okay, so uh, October 8th of 87, just the next day, Shirley Banks uh, tells her husband that uh, she is going to look for a new dress, and she never returns. Her husband started to get worried when she didn't get home uh, at, like, midnight. Shirley called in to work, complaining that she was sick and wouldn't be there. This was the following day. Uh, people in her office did not know that she was not at home or missing, or else they would have held her on the line or tried to get some more information. Some think that John made her call in sick because it was, uh, you know, like she just ran away from home, but she's not really going to work either. So he had some scheme, I think, that he was working, but... Uh, he's a fucking idiot. <laughs> October 29th, 1987, John was arrested entering Caramel Cleary's store and pulling a knife on her and another woman. This kind of is a little M.O. of his, too. He just goes into these stores that have, like, one lady working there or two ladies working there where he's like, I can gain control of this situation. Uh, he, he's a stupid, dumb idiot. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> let's see. Uh, he pulls the knives on them. Uh, he, he's he's going to do the same thing. He's going to try to rape both of these women. Uh, as soon as a man enters the store, he ran out, uh, and this this guy immediately saw what was happening. Like, what the fuck is going on? And Cannon goes right out the back door. Cannon is not one for confrontation uh, with anybody uh, of the male persuasion. <clears throat> uh, October 30th, 1987, John was charged with the abduction of Shirley Banks. John was very uncooperative and believed that the information withheld is what put him in control over police. Right? That's good, good logic, criminals. Don't be a fucking stupid, dumb idiot, like I said. Um, he, That's real. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good advice. He spent 17 days in police custody being questioned because of his stubbornness in answering the questions asked of him. He, was, he said that he had never seen her before. Right? Perfect. Uh, November 5th of 87 at a police lineup, Julia Holman positively identified the attacker as one John Cannon. He was charged with attempted kidnap. 
On November 9th, 1987, police decide not to formally charge him with kidnapping Shirley Banks after seeing the lack of evidence. All they had was eyewitness statement, which was just not enough. Pretty, look, it's funny that we've done two stories, but it feels like we just did one story, right? Because it's the same, same guy. Fucking thing. God called it. Damn it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, December 22nd of 87, John is questioned for the last time about Shirley. Her thumbprint was found in his flat, indicating that he was lying about not knowing her and their relationship was more than just an acquaintance because he had been seen, she had been seen at his flat and at 316. Uh, he was charged with the murder of Shirley and Banks. So uh, they are able to get in and they get physical evidence of the fact that. So initially it's like we, we have nothing. Uh, John's a fuck face. They're, they're just kind of figuring out a little more and they're able to get uh, a search warrant with the eyewitness statement. The search warrant yields them physical evidence of his connection to Shirley Banks. And at this time, uh, you know, it's not like if you don't have enough to charge somebody in six months when you have it, you can't. So that's 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 what went down here. Uh, and uh, luckily they were able to get that <clears throat> because uh, uh, nobody likes to see a fuck face get away again. Fuck. April 3rd, 1988, Basil and Jill Hopper and their family went for a walk on Easter Sunday and discovered a decomposed body. It appeared to be that of Shirley Ann Banks. So no longer is it all circumstantial evidence. The body has been discovered. The body suffered severe head injuries, which were believed to be the cause of death. Question number whatever. What was the murder weapon? It's like a, it's like a sad, unfortunate, off-color yeah. game of Clue. <laughs> uh, sorry. Was it A, a hammer, B, a baseball bat? I just made myself sad, so. Uh, <laughs> a, a hammer, B, a baseball bat, C, a rock, or D, was it stomped? All right, uh, Josh and Bigfoot say hammer. Robbie says it's a rack. A rock was found near where the body was, which had her blonde hair still embedded in it. Robbie is going to get another 250. Son of a I, I don't think you're. I don't think you can catch up though. I think I think Bigfoot won it. That's just a guess. How dare you? Well, I mean, like I, I literally think mathematically you can't have won it. <laughs> I don't go by math, bro. All right, yeah. I'll go I'll by faith. I love you. Blind yes. faith. Ooh. Blind faith. Let me look. Uh, no, the last one's not a not a stab. So, uh, congratulations. Can Bigfoot. we make? <laughs> Casey, <laughs> let him make it a stab. Let Casey, a stab do you want to give you away? Can, you can try to stab. I'll take the multiple choice, but if you want to try Yeah, to that's, that's, that's fair. I'll let you stab at it. It is a multiple choice that, that is a pretty stabbable question. Uh, but I will say that the stab will be for 500 to tie, and there may be an artistic challenge, because it's a pretty Ooh. stabbable question. Right. 1,000 will be re rewarding you too much for it. So if you are able to nail it, uh, 500 goes to you, which would tie you at 2,000, if Casey does not correctly answer the question in the multiple choice. Okay. Situation... Uh, broke down. Okay. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, July 14th. Oh, sorry. Okay, so The Rock. Yeah, The Rock. Hair embedded in it. It was later determined that this is what was used to kill her. July 14th, 1988. John was charged with... Get ready. There's a lot of crimes here. Having sex with Sharon Major without her consent on December 30th, 1980. Attempted to commit buggery on Sharon Major on December 30th, 1980. Making an indecent... Should have listened to the last episode, No, Robbie. I know. I was going to... Sodomy. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, making an indecent assault on Sharon Major on December 30th, 1980. Causing grievous bodily harm on Sharon Major. Raping Donna Tucker on October 6th. 1986, committing buggery on Donna Tucker on October 6, 1986, and decently assaulting Donna Tucker, took Donna Tucker away against her will and by force with the intention that she would have unlawful sex with him, uh, attempted to forcibly abduct and take away Julia Holman on October 7th, attempting to take Julia Holman away against her will and by the force and intention that she would have unlawful sex with him on October 7th. Uh, between October 7th and the 31st, he stole a car that was property of Shirley Ann Banks. October 8th, 1987, he forcibly abducted and carried away Shirley Ann Banks against her will. On October 8th, again, uh, he took Shirley Ann Banks away against her will by force with the intention that she would have unlawful sex with him. 
Uh, he murdered Shirley Ann Banks and assaulted Caramel Cleary with intention to rob. He detained Caramel Cleary against her will and by force with the intention that he, she would have unlawful sex with him. And April 26th, 1989, John was found guilty of all charges. Question number the last. Oh. What was his sentence? So Robbie's going to stab. You guys are welcome to take multiple choice. Uh, Robbie has stabbed. I'm going to stab too. Josh is going to stab. <clears throat> Fuck you, Casey. Okay. Uh, Casey taking the multiple choice. Let's stab. <laughs> hey! Oh! So uh, it's just going to be a stab here. We don't need the multiple choice for anyone. So uh, this is uh, this is this is big. This is big. It's uh, it's pretty big. <laughs> Everything you got. Everything you got. Everything you got. Everything you got. All right. His Casey, voice got high. Casey says <laughs> fifty-five years. Robbie said death. Josh said life. No parole. Well, I like that they sentenced him to opposite things there, but yeah. they effectively mean the same thing. Yep. So his sentence was life in prison with no opportunity for parole. Oh! Josh will get five hundred on it. Too bad I'm so far behind. It doesn't matter. To wrap it up, but you broke a thousand with that one. Yes. So you know, there's something to say about that. So there will be no artistic challenge. Oh. Uh, Bigfoot is going to win yet another one. Uh, what can you say, man? He's just, <laughs> he's just uh, pretty good at one this One of thing. those nights. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Bigfoot 2000, Robbie 1500, Josh 1250. It was a... Uh, it was a... Uh, it was more of a blowout than it looked like. Yeah, it was never really that close. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, really yeah. Close. That it was like when someone scores three touchdowns in the fourth, and you're like, oh, dude, it was pretty close. You're like, nah, dude. Yeah, no, but it helps fantasy close. scores. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was not garbage time. So, uh, yeah. So he was sentenced to life in prison. No possibility of parole. Um, John appealed the conviction but was rejected. Uh, he is considered a Category A offender. In full Sutton, York, he still protests his innocence. He studied at an open university degree while in jail. His minimum tariff uh, is now 35 years. So with some appeal, he was able to have the possibility of parole, not his original sentence, which is why he scored, uh, meaning that he will not become eligible for any type of parole until the year 2023. Come on up here. Uh, he will only rele be released if the poll board unanimously rules that he will be... Uh, no longer a serious danger to the public. However, he was named a Category A offender, which means he's pretty much going to always be uh, a danger to the public. So uh, take that with you, uh, everybody near where he's in prison. Uh, in July 1989, he failed to get the high court to stop the BBC from broadcasting a Crime Watch UK documentary on the investigation into the murder of Shirley Banks, uh, a case he took to the high court in January of 2003, claiming that they, the right to free and unimpeded legal advice was restricted and failed. Uh, so he's, he's just, he's trying to find something to just like keep relevant and shorten his sentence and maybe yeah. get him out. Um, in June, 2009, he lodged another case with the high court for alleged human rights breaches. He claimed that this is a great one. I love this. His ineligibility for a sexual offenses treatment program due to his continued claim of innocence was illegal. So he says, I'm innocent of sexual crimes, but I would really like to take these sexual crime classes to like learn how to not do these things. Just because. And they're like, no, you can't fucking take these. You say that you're, you're not a sexual criminal. We, yeah. we don't offer these to people who are, aren't admitted sexual criminals. Sorry. He's like, well, this is just against my basic rights. Like, I should get to take any class to teach me how to not uh, rape. Okay? You know? All right? But I'm not a rapist, though. I just prevention. But it's an I'm accent, not a right? Raper. Yeah, I'm oh. so not a raper. Yeah. So yeah, he's he's got human rights problems, you guys. Uh, he appealed for his 35 year minimum tariff to be reduced once more, but the judge, Mr. Justice Colson, ruled against this in June of 2008 because his crimes involved quote a significant degree of planning and premeditation, 
and there were, quote, no real mitigating factors at all. So uh, he, he's saying John Cannon did his crimes for no particular reason, had no fucking cares in the world, and did it uh, as premeditated as possible. Remember we talked about him casing out some of the joints. Uh, so John Cannon will be in prison forever. That's the hope. Uh, hopefully he'll just die soon so we don't have to talk about him anymore think about it. Uh, that was the uh, On the Fence episode. Uh, not really particularly serial killers, but very serial criminals. Uh, yeah. I guess we had a little more information than we thought. Uh, thank you again to uh, Robbie for uh, bringing another uh, story. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. And you're welcome. And yep. for the gift shop key. Yep, gift shop Ooh. key. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you to Josh for coming out for your first time. Uh, you're pleasure. welcome back anytime. Uh, thank you to Bigfoot, who, uh, of course, has been here one billion times. Uh, he's actually been on more episodes than me. Uh, the Laura grows. So uh, <laughs> thank you guys for coming out. Anything you guys want to throw out here tonight before we uh, leave about the case, social media, anything like that? Yeah, you can uh, find me at B I double G F double O T designs and also check out my Bigfoot erotica. Oh, Ooh. and you know what? Actually, um, by a, what is it? A governor? <laughs> Some of them. <laughs> uh, and you know what? Actually, uh, check out my uh, my Yeezys on Casey's Instagram. I will ship <laughs> if I have to ship. Um, I'm just trying to get rid of them. My wife says I can have them, but I, she doesn't want me to have them. Let's just be honest. Perfect. So uh, check them out. She said I could, but we both know she's lying. That's right. There you go. <laughs> Buy Robbie's Yeezys or whatever. Josh, anything? <laughs> is that sweet hat available on your guys' store? This this hat is like eight years old and oh. the inspiration for the name of the show. I want this it is, inside of me. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, you it's know what is available on the store? What is it? Shirts with Greg's face on it that yeah. he's showing me that you can't see. Unigreg. Oh, that's oh. right. Yeah, there's yeah. Unigreg shirts available at the Threadless store. I like the stickers, too. Uh, All right. Speaking of Una Greg, co host Greg, is there anything you'd like to add at the end of the show here? Uh, at Hella Greg on all your favorite social medias. Um, go buy a shirt with my face on it. I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually did buy it too, so don't ask for any discounts or any of that bullshit. I paid full price, you're paying full price. Yeah, I made him do that. <laughs> Life hack, he used the Patreon money. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the shirt, guys. <laughs> uh, well, if that's all, uh, th thank you, co host Greg from the Bunker Far Away. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Bigfoot. And thank you, everybody, for listening to episode 58 of the Serial Chillers Podcast. Bye. Fuck, I hope nobody gets gang stalked on the way home today. <laughs>
SerialChillersPodcast.Threadless.com is where you can go to get merchandise. You can also go to SerialChillersPodcast.com for stickers and buttons. Patreon.com slash SerialChillersPodcast if you'd like to donate to the show in any way. We appreciate that. Everything is back and fully stocked. So if you're listening to this now, by the time Season 2 is over, which is at the end of Episode 60, you will have your sticker pack from the Patreon bonuses. So thank you to everybody for that. I know that we've lost one or two patrons to this. So if those people are out there and you're still listening and you'd like to come back, if you re-sign up, I will make sure you have stickers immediately. So I apologize for lagging. We're putting so much more focus on the show. Greg and I are just going to not sleep through season three because we want this to be everything you guys have ever wanted more. So keep hitting us with the ideas. Keep hitting us with the serial killers to cover. Keep hitting us with the non-serial killers to cover. We love doing this. We love you guys. We hope to continue doing this forever. We'd love to make it our jobs. One step at a time, though. Thank you guys for doing what you do. We'll keep doing what we do. Two more episodes this season. Cannot fucking wait for season three. Remember, don't talk to strangers. This has been another presentation from Super Network.